Welcome to RPG Community College. My name is John Burgundy. I am the Dean of this prestigious institution. And today, I'm going to talk about my Vitality Cabalist. Well, it's kind of hard to call it my Vitality Cabalist, as I did start this character by following a guide, which I will have a link for in the description. It is an old one, but it is also a well-written guide, and I believe it has stood the test of time. I have upgraded my gear past what is described in the guide, however, and I think this video will serve as a good reference for one of the ways that you could further upgrade what is already a powerful starter build. As most build guides do, I will have a Grim Tools link in the description, along with some timestamps for the video. But without further ado, let's get going. This character is a Kabbalist, which is an occultist and a necromancer class combination. We make this decision because both classes are going to offer us resistance reduction and large amounts of survivability. We're going to focus on dealing vitality damage with Ravenous Earth and Bloody Pox. Bloody Pox is mainly used to clear the weaker enemies, apply debuffs, and proc devotions. It's amazing at all of these things. Ravenous Earth can be used to clear large groups of enemies, but I mostly use it for single target damage. A Blood Orb Cathan will be converting our poison damage on these skills to vitality damage, and we also make use of the Dark One set. This is a set that has a high drop chance from specific enemies in a hidden area of the game. To access this area, you're going to have to complete a secret quest. I'm not going to cover the quest in this guide, but I will leave a link in the description that's going to have a lot more information about it. In total, this build is going to reduce the enemy's offensive ability by 605. It is incredibly tanky, with good amounts of regen and tons of lifesteal from our devotion procs. And these are going off all the time. I have cleared Gladiator 170 in the Crucible. It was not the fastest run, but it was safe and easy. Be careful with the Mad Queen though, and when you choose to apply your dots. The Shattered Realm has been fun. 53 is the highest shard that I've gotten to. In softcore, you're going to be able to push this a little further. But overall, this build feels great to play, and it's going to be an amazing addition to anyone's roster of characters. In the occultist side of the tree, I max Noombolt because it's a decent damage dealer. This and the Necromancer's Blood Boil is something that I put spare skill points into after everything else is taken care of. I like the soft cap possession. The Necromancer's Master of Death is also a viable option, but possession has much more support from our gear and only takes 5 points to soft cap. And that's going to let us invest our points elsewhere in the skill tree. We don't need the defensive ability or the vitality resist from Master of Death, and we don't rely on crits for our damage. Offensive ability is always useful, but I personally value the stats from Possession more than Master of Death. I max all the skills associated with Bloody Pox. This is a great clearing skill, Devotion Procker, and provides a great debuff to the enemy's offensive ability. Fevered Rage is an interesting transmuter. I've been playing around with it a little bit recently. It does make clearing the campaign content a lot faster, and it puts a little bit of hair in your chest. But you, but you are going to die if your defenses are not immaculate. Do not take this skill if you do not know what you're doing. It's going to give monsters a 25% more multiplier to their offensive ability, and 150% total speed increase making them incredibly dangerous. I only activate this when I'm farming content that I can easily do, like Ancient Grove. I put one point into Curse of Frailty. I always try to keep this skill at at least 5 points for the movement speed and the AoE. And I would normally level up vulnerability to the soft cap, but we have some extra points to throw around, so I just ended up maxing it for some extra resist and defensive ability reduction. 
Blood of Drake is just amazing. I really can't think of a situation where you would not want to max this skill. And same goes for Aspect of the Guardian. And over on the Necromancer tree, I put one point in the Siphon Souls so that we can access Blood Boil. And that's just to further reduce enemy offensive ability. I also only put points into Blood Boil after everything else in the skill tree has been leveled. I max Ravenous Earth and Decay. I only put one point into Fall Eruption because it is an undeath effect. Instead, we rely on the Manticore Devotion for our flat resist reduction. Spectral Binding and Spectral Wrath are probably the two best Necromancer abilities. They give you tons of health, flat offensive ability, and resist reduction. You can't really ask for more than that. I always max these abilities as soon as I can. Mark of Torment's gonna be your oh shit button. I use it when times are tough and you need some breathing room. It will make you really tanky for a short amount of time, and it's gonna transfer some of the damage that your skill absorbs to the target enemy. The skill is a lifesaver, soft cap it. For attributes, I put 22 points into spirit, 14 into cunning, and 72 into physique. Here are a couple pictures to illustrate how I spent my skill points. Some of the gear for this build is incredibly easy to get, while others are going to be random drop legendaries. I'm going to be going over my gear in order of importance. Starting with the Dark One set. This set is dropped by Rift Claimed Adherence in the Edge of Reality. There are four of them in this zone, and each have a 10% chance to drop a different piece of the set. The Dark One's Gift is by far the easiest legendary set to farm in the game. It's almost too easy. It's going to provide us with an amazing buff, makes Bloody Pox apply a percent reduced damage debuff, and adds a lot of levels to both of our main damage dealing skills. Next, we have a Necromancer's Bone Spike of Decay. Another item that is actually really easy to farm. You're going to want to head on down to the mountain deeps and kill the trogs until you get a decent one of these. Any bone spike of decay will do, and they're really common. This item is going to lower the cooldown of ravenous earth, and increase the duration that it is active. Making it so that we can have two ravenous earths active at the same time, providing a huge increase to our single target damage. The third item is the mythical blood orb of Kathan. This item can be crafted. It gives us a lot of nice stats, and the aura it provides converts all of our poison damage into vitality damage. Our rings are next in line, and here we have a mythical signet of the fallen and a void heart. The most important thing about these rings is that the skill procs lower vitality resistance. Other than that, they have nice percent damage for us and some decent stats and resistances. Unfortunately, the only way to get these items is to get lucky and have them drop, or find a player who's willing to trade them. The same goes for our next item, which is the Peerless Eye of Baroneth. This amulet gives us plus one to all skills, which is huge, and the other stats are... Eh, they're okay. The active skill it gives also reduces enemy offensive ability. This is just a great necklace that can be used on almost any build. For our metal, we use a Heretic Sigil. This is also a random drop item, but a very common one, and you're going to find a lot of these, trust me. And it fits right into the build. It's going to provide great stats like health, offensive ability, damage, and it increases the level of both of our damage dealing skills. You can't really ask for more, especially out of a blue item. I also wear a pair of Dreek Sect Pants. These are really easy to farm, and they naturally come with percent offensive ability and increased health regen. Try and get a pair with flat offensive or defensive ability. Ideally, you want both, and as much resist as you can get. 
In the boot slot, we got a pair of stone plate greaves. Crafting a pair of these boots are a great way to spend your extra silver. And you can potentially make some insane pairs of boots. These ones are kind of mediocre, but they fit really well into the build. You could also try some Krieg's boots, or a pair of mythical fiend flesh greaves. They don't give you any damage, but they still could be some good replacements. For my relic, I chose Eldritch Pact. If I were to factor in my bias, this would be the most important item in this build. The amazing red orbs that boomerang across the screen are from this relic. The stats on this relic are okay for this build, but I think the most important thing that it's providing is fun. This relic just makes the build look and feel cool. If you were to put a gun to my head and force me to min-max, Serenity would be the relic that I would go with, but really just try Eldritch Pact. And last, we have our belt, the Mythical Girdle of Stolen Dreams. Not really much to say here. Lots of offensive ability, percentage damage, and plus one to all skills of cultists. Anything that helps you cap your resists and has some offensive ability on it is going to be a good replacement. Your components are going to change based on what gear you have available, but try to increase your armor absorption and cap your resistances. For augments, I can recommend a couple, but again, your character may need to change things based on their gear. I like to put Ravager's Eye on the main and offhand. I really like Regen as a defense, so Silver Sand is a go-to augment for me. After capping my resists, I put this on as many pieces of armor as I can. An Era's Blood or Basilisk Bite are both great for your rings and amulet. The best way to really get an in-depth look at the Devotion Tree is just to take a look at it yourself. If you're interested in knowing every constellation that I take, I'm going to have to point you to a Grim Tools link in the description. But I'm happy to highlight what I think are the more important aspects of the Devotions that I chose, and how they fit into the build. The first constellation that I want to talk about is the Wendigo. Based on the description, there could be some confusion as to how this constellation actually works. Any skill that is attached to the Wendigo has a chance to apply a debuff to enemies that deals damage. 65% of the damage that is dealt by the debuff is leached to you as life. The debuff lasts for 10 seconds and will deal the damage that is stated on the Wendigo's marked skill once every second. This pairs really well with Bloody Pox because Bloody Pox spreads very quickly to every enemy on your screen. It basically turns every enemy on your screen into walking life potions with one cast of the skill. And because Bloody Pox is a damage over time skill, you have the freedom to move around while you leech life from every enemy on your screen. This will allow you to kite and dodge enemies, unlike other builds that have to stand still and attack to leech life. Some people might also be confused as to why I attach Curse of Frailty to the Bat Constellation. It's pretty simple actually. Every time you hit an enemy that is affected by Curse of Frailty, you have a chance to proc the Devotion attached to Curse of Frailty. And since we are constantly hitting enemies multiple times a second with different abilities, this will consistently proc the Bat Constellation. Behemoth is a personal favorite of mine. It gives a lot of raw health, and the proc is great for regen. I'm a big fan of regen as a defensive mechanic, and you're going to be seeing this constellation in a lot of my builds. Overall, this is a strong defensive-based devotion tree. It provides a lot of life leech and health regen, with some vitality damage sprinkled in there. Getting 2900 defensive ability on this build requires some serious investment, and this Devotion Tree is pulling a lot of that weight. Most of this build's offensive ability is going to come from gear and skills. Now I'm going to play a clip of how I built the Devotion Tree for those who are interested. This can also be found down in the description if you're looking for a written version or a quick reference.
This character was incredibly easy to level. Having Turtle, Behemoth, Bat, and Wendigo for only 27 devotion points makes you practically immortal. Aspect of the Guardian and Possession help out with your resistances, and you have Spectral Binding giving you tons of health. Bloody Pox is one of the fastest skills that you could use to level as well. Its damage will fall off in Elite and Ultimate, but with support from Curse of Frailty and later on Ravenous Earth, it gets the job done. Also, in the Mountain Deeps, you can pick up a Bone Blade. This will make Bloody Pox lower vitality resistance by 10%. I grab a Bone Shield as well for some easy percent vitality damage. I level my skills in this order. The first thing I do is max everything on Bloody Pox. Then place 5 points in the Curse of Frailty, and then Vulnerability. 3 points in the Blood of Dreek, and then 1 point in the Possession. And then I max Spectral Binding and Spectral Wrath. I then head back to the Occultist, and max Aspect of the Guardian, then Blood of Dreek. Put 1 point in the Mark of Torment, and then max Ravenous Earth. This is roughly what I did. Don't be afraid to change things up though, based on your needs at the time. I also highly recommend taking a look at the guide in the description. It has an incredible level of detail, and this guide helped me tremendously when I was first starting out. There is also a beginner's guide in this channel that new players might find useful. In my beginner's guide, I said this build had the potential to dominate the endgame, and here's the proof. A Vitality Capitalist, when built and geared properly, is not only effective, but fun to play as well. If you're looking to try hardcore for the first time, or just want some breathing room in the endgame, this character will give you a lot of space to make mistakes. It's not all sunshine and roses, however. The damage can feel really bad without enough resist reduction. We do get a total of 150% reduced vitality resistance, and it still feels like I have just enough to get by. I would like to get some more damage on this build, but for now it, it gets the job done. Relying on Blood of Dreeg for your acid resistance can be sketchy as well. Under the right circumstances, an arcane hero mob will be the death of you. It is pretty good at choosing Ravager though, as you can see. Ravager has 135% vitality resistance, so you gotta debuff him and then hit him with bloody pox while running around in circles. He took me about an hour to kill, so you're gonna want to find something good to watch on Netflix before you start doing this. Overall, this is just a great build. It tackles all the content in the game, it's also a strong starter with tons of potential. As a first build, there are very few that can match the raw power of the Vitality Catalyst. But thank you for watching, and that's going to be all for this video. If you would like to continue your education, enrollment is free. All you have to do is like and subscribe. I wish you the best of luck in all your adventures, and I hope to see you again soon.